Um, this is a part of the evening I've been particularly looking forward to. Um, kindly giving us his time this evening. Um, Mr. French is uh, a, a registrar, specialist registrar. Um, actually, I met Mr. French first uh, in Mr. Charney's room, but I understand these days that you're as much associated with Mr. Mammoth. Is that not right? That's right, yes. yes. Well, I, I'm not going to presume to say anything more by way of introduction except to thank Mr. French in advance <coughs> Uh, for coming and sharing his time, uh, and um, I, I believe he will then tell you a little bit more about the job he's doing, as well as um, the uh, the kind of treatments, the non-invasive or the less invasive treatments, that is the subject of the talk. So, Mr. French. I'm going to turn, this, turn the microphone on. Hopefully that uh, means that people can hear me just a little bit better. Thank you very much, David. Um, as he mentioned, I first, first met David in Mr. Charlie's office. Mr. Charlie is one of the uh, hepatic uh, and pancreatic surgeons here at Freeman Hospital, and I've been working for him for, for a number of years now, probably getting on for about, for about nine years. And I've been involved in lots of uh, work with him, particularly looking at pancreatitis. And I think that when the three of us got together, I could see a glint in Mr. Charlie's eye about getting me involved in in doing a presentation this evening, which I think is very appropriate because I have published on, uh, on pancreatitis and I'm um, continuing to do, to do various other studies and I certainly recognise one or two people even in the audience from seeing them in, in clinics and things. As I said, I've been working for Mr. Charles for about nine years now and the work with acute pancreatitis really has changed over this period of time and I've seen it in my short career already and the changes have really come not so much with the medication we can give but the procedures we can do on individuals with the condition and what i wanted to do was to bring to you some of those procedures and show you what we're doing uh, how we're tackling the disease and how it might have been um, how that's different to how you or some of you have had, had treatment in the past and talk a little bit about the data behind that and then a little bit about what we're doing in this hospital. And I won't stand here and talk all the time. There is some images and some videos. <coughs> so this is the grand title of the talk. Um, before I start, I have to um, mention all these people here. That's me there. These people are consultants, other people involved in pancreatitis. This is not all my work. It's work with other people as well. It is a multidisciplinary team approach. So what am I going to say? Well. I'm going to talk a little bit about severe acute pancreatitis, some of the procedures available, what we're doing here, and where the future lies. A little bit of background, not too much science. Pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas gland. 85% of those people, it's a mild attack. They don't have complications associated with the pancreatitis. They come into hospital and they go out. 15% of people, that's a minority, have a severe attack of pancreatitis. We define severe attack of pancreatitis by people who have a complication. Now, this group of people in Atlanta um, sat down and decided how to define mild and severe, and the criteria were these things here. So, chest x-ray here, patient comes into hospital, they've got acute pancreatitis. This is black, this is the lung. This is air, this is your heart just here. This here is white, that shouldn't be white, it should be black, and that's an effusion. That's water in there, and that means it's a local complication. The reason for that is the pancreas sits somewhere here, causes inflammation, which causes fluid up here. If I see that on the acute admission tape, I know this patient's got severe acute pancreatitis. This is a CT scan. CT scans, some of you will know about, there are scans, a special type of x-ray. If you imagine the patient lying flat, the feet are coming out towards you and the head's going into the screen. This is a virtual body. We've sliced it like a pepperoni slice going all the way down. I'll try to point one or two things out. This is the kidney here. This is the kidney there. This here, this black fluid collection, is an abscess cavity. This is the pancreas gland just here. 
this should not be here. This is the pancreatic abscess. This is a pseudocyst, which is an abscess which has gone on for a long period of time. And this again is, is um, quite a large cavity. Kidneys here, liver there, gallbladder there. This is the pancreas just here. I've got this slide up really just to remind me to say that the other reason why people get severe pancreatitis is because they have lung failure, respiratory failure, heart failure, kidney failure, or gut failure, and that's a system failure, and that means you've got severe pancreatitis. And this is a specific note here, because the gut is full of bugs, and normally we, the bugs just live in there. We've got more bugs in our body, in our gut, than we have cells in our body. It's just normal. But with pancreatitis, what happens to the barrier to the bugs gets broken down because we're in such a uh, poor nutritional state. And those bugs get into the bloodstream, and once they get into the bloodstream, they cause systemic sepsis, but they also cause this, which is the main reason why we have to do things. So this is the pancreas. Necrosis means cell death, and it's got infection in there. Because in a large proportion of people, again, more CT scans, not too many more to come. This is the pancreas gland here, what's left of it. This is the collection around it. And these white and um, black dots there are gas in the collection, which means that there's infection in there. If we see a CT scan like that, we're thinking this patient really needs to have an operation. And that's what I've put here, surgical deprivement. UK guidelines and world guidelines say, you've got this, you need to have an operation. So, getting onto the procedures themselves. Open necrosectomy, big words in this talk, I'm afraid. I didn't take them out specifically, but I will explain them. Necro necrosis means cell death, exomy means take out. So we're taking out the dead cells, basically. And this is the way that we used to do it. Probably some of you had the operation. It's a big scar across the top of the abdomen. We go down and find the dead pancreas, and we take that out. Lots of blood vessels around the area. Pretty hairy procedure, to be perfectly honest. And up until the 1980s, this has got about an 80% mortality having this type of procedure. So, you know, there's got to be ways that we could actually improve on that. And there, is, and there has been, and there is. And some of these are the minimally invasive techniques, and that's what I want to talk about today. So that means we're not making the big cut on the abdomen, we're attacking these collections, which I've just shown you, in different ways. So, the rationale for this is that if we have a patient who's unfit for a big operation, we have to do it like that. Or it could be a bridging procedure to actually get the patient well enough for the big procedure. That was how it was originally sold to people. But people are realizing now, perhaps the best way to do it is in fact via these procedures, these minimally invasive procedures. And these are what they are. There's the percutaneous necrosectomy, which means attacking the dead cells through the skin. There's using a laparoscope, which is keyhole surgery, going after the dead cells. And there's also doing an endoscopy, which is a tube into the stomach, going through the stomach wall and getting the dead cells out as well. This will become apparent when I show you some pictures. Another CT scan. So, this is the dead pancreas. This is under CT guide that a drain's been put in. So this is going into the pancreas itself. Under, under sedation, the patient's got low anesthetic sedation, it goes into there. The next thing we do is under respiratory control, we dilate that tract up and put a bigger drain in. And that's shown on this CT scan there. Now, hopefully this will project, this is a video presentation. This is actually from, um, it's got no sound, but I'll give you a commentary as it goes through it. This is actually from a gentleman called Mr. Carter, Ross Carter from Glasgow. And he's one of the first people in the whole world to do this type of uh, procedure. And it's really started with him in Glasgow and it's slowly going across the entire, uh, across the world. If you have pancreatitis in America, you always think of people in America having better um, ways of dealing things with us. They don't yet do this. It lasts for about four minutes. So 
again, it's a CT scan. This is the collection we're going after. We would have to do an open operation in years gone by. This is the CT guided drain that's gone in, as we can see there. Now this is in the operating theatre. This is the drain coming out of the patient. This is the patient. These are the instruments we use to dilate the tract up because the drain is only about three millimetres. We use this to dilate it up to about 12 millimetres to make the whole bigger, basically. And that's what's happening there. Let me alarm just a little bit of blood. This is under X-ray control. It's pushing it in there. And it's just going in, dilating up the tract. Out he goes, and he goes in with the bigger one. <laughs> sure. Looks a bit barbaric there, but um, it's worked very well. <laughs> this is the cat. This is the catheter sheath that's going in there. So that is going to now stay in the patient. And the whole reason to dilate this tract up. And this is interesting. But look at the pressure of the necrosis in there. Yeah, that's dead pancreatic tissue. The pressure is obviously enough for it to come out of there. That's what's making the patient unwell. It's just like having a huge abscess next to your pancreas. The reason for that is to dilate up so we can put these instruments in there. These are, these are called the nephroscopes. These are actually urological instruments. We nicked these off the urology doctors. <laughs> It's got irrigation going in, so it's putting water in by this pipe and it's suctioning out by this pipe. It's got a camera on the end and just sort of giving it a good wash out so you can actually start to see things. This is what you look down the tube. This is dead pancreatic tissue. And what you'll do is just clear the tube out on the end here. It's got some graspers to pick those bits of dead pancreas out and it's putting it in. Again, this is the cavity inside the abdomen. This is all bits of dead pancreas on the side. It's pulling out. Not too much now. What you want to do when you're doing this procedure is you want to pull out just enough of the pancreas which is dead. You then want to start pulling out bits of tissue which are alive. And as soon as you start seeing red bits, you stop pulling. You don't want to see a lot of red bits. You want to make sure you know exactly where to stop. <laughs> As you can see now, the cavity is looking very red. So you don't want to start pulling any more of that out. That's looking like a healthy cavity. Some big vessels around there. Splenic artery and aorta and other big vessels. So, uh, now this is the drain uh, with an irrigation piece. And this is the amount of pancreatic necrotic tissue that's actually got out of there, which is a significant amount. So you compare a hole the size of, what is it, a 10 pence piece, less than that compared to a huge scar that goes across the top of the abdomen. You know, so it's a really good way of doing it. That's the irrigation drain left in situ there. We irrigate that. I've actually put some of these slides in before I got that video. So this is what we do in Newcastle. I did have a video of myself doing it, but unfortunately this computer just doesn't play it. But never mind, I'm not. <laughs> that, that too worried about being on the stage. So these instruments that we use, uh, very, very similar. We dilate up the tract with these. We put uh, one on top of the other. It goes, goes, this is the sheath. And then this is the nephroscope, which goes down here and pick things out. Uh, and this is in the operating theatre. Patients uh, now have gone home and have got the permission to do this uh, presentation. There's myself there. And we've got the radiologically placed drain in, in position there. And this is me performing an echosectomy. There's the tube. This is the nephroscope. This is the screen I'm looking at. And you can just see that I'm starting to pick out some of this dead tissue. I don't know why she moves. not very interested. I'm more interested in something which is happening down there. So. <laughs> This is the tube uh, looking down, there's a bit of dead pancreas I'm about to take out. And these are our bits of pancreas that I've pulled out. Uh, just 
basically dead meat, which is a, is a, is a focus for infection and making the patient very unwell. So, um, what we want, um, there are limitations associated with this. Um, it has to be in a region which we can actually get to with regard to the CT guided trade. Not every collection we can like that. But these fears that we had beforehand have actually not really borne out. And because we can go into the pancreas via the left or the right, we can actually get to just about every area. So this was something that we didn't really come across. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the second approach. So we've seen the approach going straight through the skin, go straight through the pancreas. <coughs> what about going with the telescope? So some of you may have had endoscopies, telescope down, look inside the stomach. What happens if you have this sort of situation? We have the stomach here, okay? The patient's lying on, the, on his or her back. This is contrast because it's white, something that's swallowed, uh, fluid. This is air, so they've got obviously the water level there. This is the stomach here. It's got a huge bulge into it. You probably have started to recognize now, this is a collection which shouldn't be there. That's from acute pancreatitis. So what happens, could we go, from, instead of going from the CT guided drain in here, it's a bit risky, isn't it? So we've got spleen there, we've got kidney there, we've got liver there, big vessels here, a bit tricky. What about from there, straight in here? Some patients with this type of procedure aren't actually, um, we can't do it. This patient has got multiple uh, loculations, so we couldn't do it with this patient. This patient's got involvement in the abdominal walls, that would be difficult. And this patient's got a very small collection of big vessels in between, so we wouldn't want to do it there. So I'm not selling it as a panacea, but it's another weapon in our armory. Another couple of videos here. This is um, ultrasound. So what happens is you have the telescope down, it looks inside your stomach, it's got an ultrasound probe at the bottom. The ultrasound probe presses against where we think the big cyst is, and the black's fluid and the white tissue. So we can obviously see here, we've got the right spot. This is a video of an actual um, uh, endoscopic procedure. <coughs> we'll see how far we get with it. Just go a bit hazy at one particular point, but you'll get the idea about what it looks like. But unfortunately, it's black and white, but I think you will get the idea. So this is inside your tummy. And what we have is we've got a huge bulge here. That's bulging into the stomach. That shouldn't be there. We've ultrasounded it, so we know it's fluid. This is a cannula. It's pushing into the cyst. These cyst walls are quite a thick wall, actually, so it does take a bit of force. I think it's Dr. Apong which did this, one of our gastroenterologists. I don't think he could get in the first time, so I think he uses a bit of electric current just to go through to get in. That is, it's not a, uh, this is not a pseudocyst, this is a, a, an acute collection. But you can use this for a pseudocyst as well. <coughs> the difference between a pseudocyst and a collection is a pseudocyst has been there for four weeks, whereas a collection is usually in the acute stage, whereas um, a pseudocyst is a, a late complication. I'll not play this for too much, too much longer. But suffice to say that what Dr. Pong's trying to do now, he's got a wider cannula again, it's the same principle, you put a fine wire in, you dilate it up, and what he's trying to put in is a stent. A stent's like a small tube-like straw structure, and that's hopefully going to go into this cyst, and then the fluid will drain from the cyst into the stomach. Sounds pretty unpalatable, actually, that stuff going into your stomach, but you don't taste it. I think we'll call it, we'll call it the quality uh, isn't so good after that. And this is what it looks like when we CT scan the patient. You can see here, this is the stomach, here's this uh, stent going into this big collection. Um, and believe it or not, that will start to drain through those stents. What do you do with the stent afterwards? That stent has to be taken out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, can't, we can't leave that in. There has been some hairy moments where you can imagine um, the stent, instead of being half out and half in, they're, they're what we call pigtails. So they've got, you know, they're straight and they've got a curl on the end. So when it goes in, Curls up when it's on the outside, it curls up so it shouldn't be able to move. But we have had a situation where one of these stents has gone in there, which was you just have to remain calm and pass some little forceps into the cavity, and you can usually blindly just, just grab it back. So 
Ideally, they should transverse the, um, the actual wall of the cyst. Okay, just wanted to tell you briefly about all this is in theory, but what have we done actually at Freeman Hospital? Um, our first procedure was May 2002. This is just looking at uh, predominantly the endoscopic procedures. 13 patients with this infected necrosis, the indication to have it done. Quite a lot of data here, so I'll just skip through it. Suffice to say that the, the actual reason we wanted to do this was to try to have some evidence which would suggest that doing it with these minimally invasive techniques was better than the big operation. So to do a test, you have to make sure that the patients who are having one type of procedure are the similar type of patients who are having another type of procedure. I mean, it makes sense really. You can't have these patients between you know, all 80 years of age and all these 50 years of age because there's going to be a difference there. So what we've just looked at here is to make, try to make sure that these, these patients are all, uh, all, all the same with regard to their um, severity on CT, etc., etc. So just to prove that they've all got bacteria lurking there. Um, interesting point on this procedure is to say, uh, on this slide is to say that these patients do require repeated procedures. So with the one big cut, you actually, it's usually just one procedure. But with the minimally invasive ones, you do have to go back time and time again. Um, okay, we did have some patients that unfortunately died, but these were actually of uh, conditions not related to the pancreatitis. This is a patient who got very severe angina, unfortunately uh, had a heart attack, and this in fact was a, uh, a chest drain that was put in the ITU. Unfortunately, the patient died after that was inserted because it had a major vessel, but these things unfortunately didn't happen. Um, so, does it improve outcome? So, these are the groups we looked at 95 to 99, that's when we were only doing the big, big cut. Next page, next time was open and percutaneous, which means being cut and the first thing with the, with the CT guided drain, and then we're getting more weapons now. We've got open and and endoscopic as well. So we've got all the, if we've got these three procedures versus one, are these patients <coughs> doing better than these patients? Um, this is the page 33, 37, 42. Um, so good numbers of patients, and this is to compare what happened to them. If we look here at total hospital stay, 65 days for the, just the open, 49 for open plus percutaneous, but only 34 for the three types of procedure. Um, and this is a score of how well they were. They're all about the same. Other thing to see as well, deaths, 39%, 46, and only 33% when we've got all the um, uh, modalities available to us. Uh, some more data, I'll just skip through these. This just our highlights, only 33% death. You may think, well, that's quite a lot actually, 33%, one in three, but you know, the literature on these patients in the 1990s was 80% mortality, so you know, we have actually come a long way. Um, ITU stay, you can see ITU stay is about the same, but there's a trend towards group three having less stay in the ITU. Certainly, the total hospital stays less. Um, why did I put this slide up? I think this was to show that the uh, patients had the same. Uh, what I wanted to make sure was that the patients who had open necrosectomy only weren't, in fact, a worse group. And in fact, if we look at this, there are actually a better score. This is acute physiology and chronic health evaluation, it just takes lots of things into account. These patients were actually better than the patients we've done the three procedures on. So, in conclusion of this particular section, we think that endoscopic necrosectomy is uh, feasible um, and we think it reduces the hospital stay. Those are the conclusions we can uh, draw. Percutaneous necrosectomy, I think, has got a significant advantage. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got enough numbers to prove that statistically the bugbear of some medical science these days. I say bugbear because in years gone by people who just done it and said this is the best way we're going to do it. Now we have to have trials which compare one, one and the other. So now we've, we've talked a little bit about we've identified a problem. We don't think the procedure we had to deal with the problem was very good so we've got some new techniques. How can we help people in this region 
with these new techniques? That was the question that Mr. Charlie and myself sat down and we thought about trying to expand this procedure to include people of this of the whole region. Before we can do that, we have to collect data. Again, it's coming back to data, it's coming back to figures, it's coming back to numbers. And the way that we're going to do that is a project that I'm involved in, and it's looking at every hospital in the northern subregion. So medical students are going to be collecting the data, myself and Mr. Charman. So why are we going to do it? I've just probably answered some of those questions. 50% of all cases, um, it's to do with guidelines. And there's actually a feeling that for example, if you have acute pancreatitis in North Allerton, which is under our jurisdiction, then the ideal place for you to be treated severe pancreatitis is really at the Freedom Hospital because we've got the multidisciplinary team approach. The problem is the logistics of actually getting that patient here are quite large. It's mainly due to resource, to be perfectly honest, because we've got the will and willingness to actually get the patient here. But can we? Um, we need to be able to prove there's a problem and then prove we can do something about it. And what we're trying to do here is prove there's actually a problem. So what, what Matthew is going to do is going to go around all the hospitals in nine months. It's going to collect all the data from 700 cases mild, then it's 140 the severe cases. It's going to collect all the data on these cases, um, looking at all these particular things. So basically, we're going to have a full data set, we're going to know what's happened to them, when they've had CT scans, how bad their inflammation is. And what that will give us is it will give us a number of patients that we could potentially help at Freedom Hospital. So we'll say how many patients, what's the disease burden, and do these patients have access to the Freedom Hospital? And if they don't, we want to really say to people who can actually give us the resources to be able to do it, we need to actually help these people. So the overall conclusions of the talk really are, it's got a significant instance of about 150 patients a year have this problem. You need to have a multiple disciplinary team, you need to have surgeons, you need to have endoscopists, you need to have radiologists, you need to have people in ITU. You need to have nutritionists, you need to have physiotherapists, and you need to have just a group of people who are interested in the disease. There's new techniques that are available, which we only do at the tertiary centre. These, these procedures are not done in any other centre in the North East virtually a few centres in the UK, to be perfectly honest. So we want to highlight the problem, and we can potentially get more resources if we highlight the problem, which is greater care for the patients in the region, which is hopefully going to reduce mortality, which is death, and morbidity, which is complications. Thank you very much. Kindly offered in advance to take a few questions. Yes, that's fine, yes sir. More than happy to, uh, sorry if it was quite a technical talk, but I want to try and give you some idea about what we, what we do. You said in your video that the, you, you removed dead pancreas, or piece of dead pancreas. Um, when Mr. Charlie did mine, he kept referring to it as calcified. Are you, are you still talking about the same thing? Yeah, calcification is a process which happens in um, tissue which has been damaged. So, um, the calcification means that the pancreas has gone through some damage, it's got fibrosed, and if calcium is there, it doesn't necessarily mean that the pancreas is dead if the calcium is there. It's probably some time ago that that's happened. Right. So. Because right. he, he did the, uh, the full moon on me. Oh, he did the full, uh, yes, full open? the full bit. Right. right. Yeah. And you left the head in as well, by the way. I was going to say, did you manage to avoid diabetes? Uh, up till three years ago, yes. Years ago. I've just gone. I've just gone on to uh, insulin the last two years, but um, prior to that, it was using the glycoside tablets. Yeah. But just the head of pancreas kept kept it going. Kept it going for it was 1997 when I had the operation. Right. But kept it going for a few years, admittedly very slowly and gingerly, but kept it going. What about, uh, are you still taking Creon? Yes, that's the downside of it, but hey, I'm still alive. Looking good as well. Can I just say the head of the pancreas on my hand? Right. Um, does that have to be removed? It doesn't have to be removed, no, because what will happen is that we only have to remove pancreatic tissue if it dies, 
if it becomes infected. And that's the whole base about doing an operation. We can watch a pancreas gland that's inflamed, and we can see that it's died, and as long as you don't miss any complications from that, it will just wither away. So it shouldn't cause a problem at all. Yeah, well, you probably that was the That's the, one of the functions of the pancreas is to provide enzymes, which are chemicals which break the food down. So, in fact, every single patient with severe pancreatitis, irrespective of really whether they need creon, we always give it. Uh, because in fact it helps symptoms and it is people are probably got a subclinical level of poor nutrition so uh, creon is something I'm afraid is you have to sprinkle on or you want to swallow them? just swallow them, swallow them do you? 40,000 milligrams should we paint to do? same thing <laughs> you've tried the sprinkly stuff I haven't, I do know that some patients if they don't like taking the big cylinders you can you can get the granules and you can sprinkle it on the food but I've not had it first is it, is it palatable? No, it's not very palatable at all. <laughs> I think the kids I teach just think I'm hooked on something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a question not really related directly to your talk. Does that Could you right? speak so that uh, others could hear? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, two questions. One is related to what you've been speaking about, which is perhaps how you still select, uh, you're still using the open surgery. And the other one is, this is just a question of interest as, a, as a, an alien from the Merseyside I am at the, at the Royal the Hospital in Liverpool. How often is a total pancreatic to um, undertake? Um, Would you say? Right, okay. Here at free? Uh, first question was yeah. about selecting which patients have the uh, procedure. Here at the Freeman Hospital now, we're really in a situation that um, if a patient has got infected, pancreatic necrosis or an infected abscess which is a fluid collection which has got infection in, and the patient is unwell showing signs of organ failure and that is our indication to an operation. Our first line of managing those patients would be with minimally invasive techniques. So any patient we can possibly do that drains in via CT guided and endoscopy we can start off with that. And really since 2002 we have only used the open procedure failure of the minimum invasive techniques or a complication which is a risk from them, which is actually quite a, a small number of people. So we're really, really pressing pressing this. Um, the second question which is with regard to uh, total okay. microtectomy, actually it's interesting because um, in, uh, in Liverpool they do this procedure, they call it a skunk procedure, which is... Uh, it's the it, it certainly does that actually. It does it slightly differently but Virtually the same, uh, same, uh, same technique. That's going to be a supplementary question that each surgeon seems to have a slightly different way yeah. of approaching this. Yeah, doing the plumbing, as he puts it. That's right. I mean, they have. I think probably that's related to pancreatic cancer issues, but certainly acute pancreatitis. You've got to, the base of it is you've got dead pancreas in there. It's infected. You've got to get it out. The way to get it out really is using a small pump rather than a bigger one. The question of total pancreatectomy um, is something that was in the acute stage for acute pancreatitis, you don't go in and say you're going to take the whole pancreas out because the inflammation around the tissues is just impossible to do. You do have a damage limitation, you take out the bit of the pancreas which is dead and then you deal with the complications later. Total pancreatectomy is usually reserved for the elective state of the patient, for example, if they've got multi uh, uh, so cancer of the pancreas or poly polycystic disease of the can uh, pancreas and also if you're doing an operation on the pancreas to take the pancreas head out and the rest of the pancreas looks difficult to do a plumbing with you would say right we're going to take the rest of the pancreas out. Um, you make that sort of decision on the spot? That would be a decision on the spot. So if I'm doing an operation we take the pancreatic head out, this is for pancreatic cancer not pancreatitis, you take the pancreatic head out, you've got to join the pancreas up with the bowel if that pancreas is looking like boiled fish, which is its usual way that it looks, well, well, it can look, and it won't take the sutures, then you would actually say, look, this has got a high chance of leaking, which is a major complication, so we're going to actually take, take, take the, uh, the pancreas out. We try not to do that because that means the patients then have brittle diabetes, which is quite a severe form of diabetes. So it's not a slow onset, it comes on very quickly, and it's, it can be quite difficult. That's the difficulty if you choose to, as I marked as a hereditary pancreatitis sufferer. Right. It's a choice 
Now, you, right can swing, you can swing from 20. Yeah. You, you know, down to like two in, in, in minutes. Without even, yeah, uh, I mean, you're changing your diet. That's the problem. Unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, the body's a homeostatic mechanism that's gone and all doing it artificially isn't, isn't quite as good. Um, hereditary pancreatitis is another interesting topic, actually. There are advances with regard to that with which genes are involved. Um, and so you can advise on counselling. Um, uh, interesting, you should talk about total pancreatectomy and hereditary pancreatitis. Not an indication really at the moment um, if there's no evidence of disease pancreas, although it's difficult to monitor. It's difficult to monitor. Yeah, absolutely right. Yes, there's no there's no set guidelines. I think you just have to have common sense. Um, I think it'd be lying if it says that total pancreatectomy has not been done for that. It's not been done at this institution. I think in, around the world it's probably done. But you see, if we weigh up the balance. Total pancreatectomy of Britain diabetes, you have diabetes, you have all the complications of having diabetes for the rest of your life. So it's not a. Like so many times in medicine, there aren't any black and white it's answers. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great. Yeah, I was just wondering how many ha uh, were done at the Freeman. Uh, total pancreatectomy for, would be... For that sort of reason, I mean. Um, below 10. Not non hereditary pancreatitis, but prophylactically. But that must have been that there was a, a reason to suspect something in the pancreas, is that right? I think he just, because my dad was 46 when he died, and he just said, you know, in case it turns cancerous. Right, right, right. You usually would see some mass or something in the pancreas. I've been back since I was seven, I have to back when you go in, yeah. like people -wise. How quickly would you have to come back? It's a good question, yeah. We, uh, with the one which has got the drain in the side, uh, we, we have to go back probably on a weekly basis. Uh, there's a gentleman on the ward, in fact, the gentleman you saw has gone home now, went in five times. Um, and um, the reason why we leave it a week is that you saw at the end there was a drain that was left in. The drain would irrigate with water. What the water does, it just slowly goes in, it softens the pancreas. So more pancreas dies, it softens it. So when I go with the telescope, I just find it easy to pick out. What you don't want to be doing is when you go with the telescope and the graspers, is tugging on things. There's things that are a bit difficult to pull, it can be attached to a vessel, you can pull it and then you get quite a lot of leaks. So you want it to sort of soak, basically. It's so about a week. So if you leave any tissue behind, will the infection stay there and come back at the later date? You have to, I mean, the basis of it is you have to clear it out. Um, and uh, the patient's clinical condition will dictate whether you've got to do all out or not. What normally happens is you get the drain, you do the procedure, you CT scan them on a Monday, you go in again on the Wednesday, Thursday, you wait, you CT scan them on the Tuesday, you go back in and you just see where the collections are and you go after them. That's the practical, practical aspect of it. You have to get all the tissue out. Does that tube stay in? Or? No, it doesn't. Okay. It's just going in. So you wouldn't have to make the hole in you? No, time. you're right. The, 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 the drainage tube. Yeah. Once we've dilated the tractor, mm -hmm. is uh, 12 millimeters in the tract there. So I guess that that kind of draining is uh, much more efficient than the sort of thing I expect others and I have experienced of having drains attached when we had a big operation mm -hmm. that took something like a fortnight to clear yeah. before we could go home. Yeah. But that is that why your time in hospital is is, is reduced. I think, it's, I, think it's a efficient draining. I think it's a number of things. I think it's because you haven't got a huge abdominal scar well, to get true, over. Yeah. And then what that means is it's difficult to breathe and you get the chest complications. Um, sometimes the abdomen has to be left open, um, which requires um, additional surgical procedures to close. Right. Um, so the drains themselves, you're absolutely right there. What they used to do with the open procedure was put the drains through the stomach. Mm. So you go through the stomach into the collection. Now you have to make sure that those drains are completely healed before you go home. Patients with drains in the side, these patients come in for a month. They know how to deal with the drains. And we send patients home with the drains when they're just being managed. So yes, then it, the, the difference in drains can make a difference.
I know that I know that you're interested in how old people stay in hospital, but it seems to me that the actual home recovery afterwards would be a lot quicker with the minimally invasive. That's a very good point, and I've got no again I keep going back to the point of data, but there are quality of life questionnaires that we really ought to get um, to grips with, um, because that, in essence, is, is is why we're doing the procedure is to save a life, but also to make sure that we keep very fast. Well, but because I, I know with the main operation it's about 12 weeks recovery, yeah. which is an awful long time. Yeah. But I, I would imagine with this it's, it's a lot shorter. I, th I mean, again, I've got no data, but certainly anecdotally looking at the patients we've done, when you send them home and you see them in the clinic, you usually see them pretty quickly, first couple of weeks, but then you space it out. Mm -hmm. By this, you know, a couple of uh, months down the line, they're actually you know, skipping around, so uh, that's what we have seen yet. But we do need to get some data on that actually. Yeah. Get a questionnaire, you know, ask me what you've been doing, have you been driving, and things like that. Because it's, 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 you have to have these things to present to people to say, this is good, we need more resources to be able to do, uh, do these things. Time for another question or so. I'm going to take the chairman's privilege and ask one then. Uh, which is, does it require less um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, uh, when, when, uh, uh, you, you're out for less time. Anesthetic. Uh, anesthetic, yeah. But does it require shorter anesthesia, less anesthetic, to do these minimally available? I think we haven't added all the operations up together. It would yeah. be longer. Longer, I think, oh, I see. because you can do, you have to do sometimes right. five times, yeah. the average four times. Right. I was um, wondering whether that account for <laughs> what you said, people skipping around more quickly. I, th I, th I think the reason is, though, is that the insult to the body oh, right. is yeah. far less yeah. when you do these minimum invasive yeah. procedures, whereas you have one big operation, it's a huge insult to the body, yeah. and then it can take an awful long time right. to push the cover. So I think it's, uh, it's that. Yeah. On a minimal procedure that you, that you do, can you actually move, uh, as my operation was, everything bar on the head of the pancreas, would you? Or that's, is that's, that uh, asking a little that's bit too some good questions. If you imagine the scope that we put in was a rigid scope, it was, yeah. it was solid. The pancreas is like, um, well, I'm trying to trace it out of here, it comes along, then it goes down, but then it goes up like that. Yeah. So you put the scope in here, how do you get around the corner? Yeah. Now the way that we've got around that is that I don't really remember that, but the virtual body's here. Instead of going in this way, you go in this way. So that's why you can go bilaterally and get the head yeah. over both sides. What you can do, though, and what we're looking at doing is more, is using, instead of a rigid scope, is a flexible scope. Right. So you put the scope in, it's like a little snake, and it goes in, and then you, you turn a cog, and you go around the corner, and then you can take things out like that. So yeah. that would mean that you can do it. And in fact, it's the incredible view that you get, because the last patient I did, the duodenum sits like that, the pancreatic head sits in there, and you can see all the vessels going around the duodenum. And the aorta is at the bottom of the vena cava, and it's just, it's just incredible. So the answer is yes, you can, but again, it's instrumentation. Yes. So it's virtually going to be the point at some time, and then perhaps not too distant future, you can remove all that you need to do and tie it off. Yes. And keep your fingers crossed that nothing goes wrong. I mean, the, the, the principle of it is that the tissue you're taking away is dead. And so it should have got a blood supply, that's the whole point. But you do have the occasion where it's attached to something alive and it picks off, so you have to be careful. But yes. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually we should be able to do it more like this. Yeah. So the complications of having a huge operation, like that, in my case, nine and a half hours of surgery, yeah. um, as things progress, you'd probably be able to do it in sort of minimal, perhaps two or three techniques yeah. um, and end up with a better result. I Certainly, I cosmetically, think, anyway. I think so. I, yeah. really, I really do think so, actually. Yeah. You know, it's the way forward. Okay. Did you want to ask well, one more? I, uh, I, I will uh, open if you give me permission. Yes, okay, quickly. Right. Um, uh, just to clarify, are you talking about removing this material both from within the pancreas and in an acute collection that's yeah. gone outside the pancreas? Yeah. Absolutely oh, right, because okay. the, the pancreas is in the retroperitoneum, which means it's behind the abdominal cavity, and there's lots of fat in there and everybody. Um, and what happens, the pancreas leaks its fluid. The job of the pancreas is to help you absorb food, and you, we are just food, basically. So if these, 
these chemicals leak out, it can actually cause uh, necrosis cell death of the fat around. So when we put the when the guy stuck in the uh, the um, the sheath and we got that rubbish that was coming out, that's dead pancreas. It's dead fat. It's dead connective tissue around the pancreas. So it is peripancreatic tissue as well. Uh, it's dead and it's infected, so it's got to come out. And that's that's the tissue that causes most of the pain for for us all, isn't it? It is the, it's the, the enzymes. The enzymes, the enzymes and basically they hit the celiac nerves, which are the nerves at the back of the pancreas, and that's what gives uh, gives you the pain. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to, to suggest now we go and uh, do other things, but not before I've said a very warm thank you, to Mr. French. But fascinating, if at times boring. Yeah, sorry about that. It's it really uh, no, no, no. I mean, I think um, there was a level of concentration in the audience that, that was a testament to the to the interest you created. And it's lovely to listen to an enthusiast, isn't it? <laughs> talking about something that. Uh, well, I'm just glad we're in the hands of people who clearly are so committed to the job of making us better, <coughs> as Mr. French has demonstrated he is. Uh, that, uh, I, I'm sure you will share that view of this talk. Pancreas, I, just once, I, don't <laughs> I just wish it, that, that that had been around. I noticed the October uh, 2002 watershed mm -hmm. and uh, realised that I was operating on the big one in September 2002. There you go. <laughs> um, anyway, no, not to be personal, I, I think that has um, been of great interest to us all and I'd like you to thank Mr. French. <laughs>